our next presentation will be by Professor Panayatis Chotras. He is the David and Andrew Lewis Endowed Chair Professor at the School of Aerospace Engineering at Georgia Tech. He is also the Director of the Dynamics and Control Systems Laboratory and an Associate Director of the Institute for Robotics and Intelligent Machines. Please join me in welcoming Professor Chotras. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks, uh, especially Eric, for inviting me. Um, I will uh, present some of the work we have been doing in the lab for the last um, almost 10 years now, a little bit less than 10 years, uh, on uh, planning, uh, specifically using sampling-based algorithms for motion planning uh, for uh, autonomous systems. I just want to start with uh, uh, the observation that uh, this, uh, the problem of planning, it is the one of the most uh, is basically going from point A to point B by while avoiding obstacles. And um, it seems that it's an easy problem, but it turns out that it's not an easy problem at all. It's a very difficult problem. Nevertheless, uh, it's a problem that appears in many applications. For example, you can have any system that, um, like here's examples of systems, for instance, robotic systems uh, um, that are in industrial robots, for example, they want to move from one point to another. Uh, autonomous vehicles, of course, you can have aerial vehicles, you want to move in a, an environment that um, it is uh, avoid obstacles. Some of these are obvious, some of them are less obvious. For example, you have surgical procedures, you want to move the needle inside the tissue uh, this is, turns out to be a planning problem, planning a path planning problem when you want to move the needle or the catheter and you try not to hit any obstacles, in this case, the tissue. Another one that is may not be as obvious is, for example, protein folding, where you want to figure out how the protein falls from one orientation to another orientation, uh, another configuration to another configuration. It turns out this is, again, a problem of uh, high dimensional space, right? It has a several thousand degrees of freedom in this case. And the way this protein falls actually may determine when the uh, particular drag is going to be effective or not. So all these are problems um, that essentially amount to planning between uh, one point and another point. And the difficulty is that these are typically probably in high dimensional spaces. So how do you solve these types of problems? Um, initially, if, uh, if, you, if, it's pro if the problem is not high dimensional, then typically what you're going to do, you have to create some form of abstraction uh, using a typically gridding. Um, and then you create a graph. And by creating a graph, then you have a graph search problem. And there are many algorithms to solve these types of problems for many years. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is now we're talking about problems in high dimensional spaces and gridding is not going to work for these types of systems. Uh, gridding after four dimensions does not work at all. So how can you deal with these types of problems? And one of the ideas that has been around actually for several years is to avoid gridding. So, I mean, avoiding building the graph a priori, but then uh, you build the graph as you go. Uh, typically by sampling. This is, gives a rise to a, a class of algorithms that are called sampling-based algorithms that I'm going to discuss a little bit today. So there are a couple of different techniques. I'm going to focus on two of the main algorithms out there, one of them in particular, then I'll show you how you can improve uh, what is out there based on state-of-the-art type of approaches that we have developed in my lab. The uh, the first type of algorithm that has been around, had been around for many years, is the RRT algorithm, where basically you sample the space randomly and then you create a, a space filling um, graph in the in the search space, and then you search over this uh, graph. There is three actually. It is a tree. So here it is. It's an example that you. Uh, I don't know how well you can see. It's an example that. Um, create a tree which is rooted at the beginning, you want to go to the end, the magenta is at the end, and then you see after a while you find a path. And it turns out that this is probabilistically complete, meaning that you will find a path if one exists. Uh, this is great. Uh, however, uh, as was shown back in 2011, uh, this algorithm will converge to a suboptimal path in probability one, uh, the reason being that there is no optimality here. You just explore, and then when you find the optimal, the, sorry, the a path, that will be the solution any path will do. That's not very good because in most cases, we're looking for optimal paths. And for many years, actually, 
Not many people looked at those algorithms because they have no optimality guarantees. And actually, uh, as, as, as mentioned in this theorem, uh, you, you almost guarantee that you're going to get a suboptimal solution. Nevertheless, same year, um, Karaman and Frazoli developed a variation of RRT, which is called RRT star, which does a little bit of uh, manipulation. I don't want to get into the details. There's some local rewiring when you sample points in the space, and you get something that looks much better. So this is the uh, RRT um, algorithm, sorry, RRT star algorithm, which actually um, can show uh, that uh, with probability one, uh, you get to the optimal solution. As you can see here, as increases, uh, the uh, the algorithm goes to, to the optimal solution. So this is nice. This has been around for several years now. RRT star has become the workhorse uh, for many uh, applications in robotics has been used a lot in um, autonomous vehicles. Several uh, self-driving vehicles use these types of algorithms. So what is wrong with RRT star? Well, uh, nothing is wrong in particular, except the fact that the theorem states that you're going to get the optimal solution as the number of samples goes to infinity. Uh, in reality, you're never going to sample all the way to infinity. You're going to sample only a finite number of samples. It will be large, but it's going to be a finite number of samples in any case. And then we have a sum data structure, uh, and then you um, <clears throat> generate the solution based on this data structure. And since this, uh, you have only a finite number of samples, there's no guarantee that the solution you're going to get is going to be optimal given that data structure, right? So what we did is look at the problem uh, again. Um, that's almost just for several years now, uh, where we looked at uh, the question, is it possible to, to, to keep track of what is the optimal path or the optimal solution given the current data structure? And as you continue uh, getting better and better solutions, uh, is it possible, uh, while well, getting a better and more and more and more samples, is it possible to improve the solution without starting from scratch, but maybe uh, uh, using the previous uh, the previous path? So it turns out that there is incremented al incremental algorithms that keep track of the optimal path. Specifically, <clears throat> there is a so-called lifelong planning A star algorithm. Don't want to get into the details, but essentially it says that there is a way that you can keep track of some information in the path, in, the, in, in your current path, that will allow you to, when you do replanning, to do the minimum to, 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 to do minimum replanning in some sense. Uh, it is based on the fact that you have um, uh, you have two values of the cost to come, the your, your distance from, from the root. Uh, this is what is called LMC value. Uh, and here is the G value. These are the two values that uh, you want to keep track. And you impose the so-called stationarity condition. Essentially, what turns out the LMC value, which is the minimum of uh, G plus uh, some extra information about the cost to connect these two nodes, it is more informed than the G value. So essentially, when you, in, uh, when you look at your data structure, you impose this condition. Uh, which is called the stationarity condition. It's easier to show that only only consistent vertices, that means vertices that satisfy the stationarity condition can be part of the optimal path. So you're trying to make all vertices stationary, and if you can um, do that, at least for the ones that are on optimal path, you find the optimal path. Now, why this is going to work? Uh, initially, it looks like uh, a little bit of a mystery why you should be doing that, but if you look at the Bellman equation, which is essentially sort of looking at the predecessors of the vertex, you can look at the successor of the vertex. This depends whether you want to go to, when you're running this algorithm forward or you're running backwards from the goal, I essentially it generally amounts to do a Bellman equation. So essentially imposing the stationary condition means that you're doing some Bellman update. So this was the big insight uh, behind this RRP sharp algorithm. And when you do this connection with dynamic programming, you can make different different variations of the algorithm uh, when you have the standard algorithm RRT sharp, which essentially amounts to doing some um, asynchronous uh, value iteration on this random graph, or you can do policy iteration, you can do some other stuff. So it turns out that uh, we implemented all that. Um, you, depending on the stationarity of the vertex, you can have different versions, and you can allow to do smart pruning. So here is how uh, it looks like for this particular application that you show here. And you can see that it gets to the optimal solution. You can have different versions of the algorithm, as you can show here, depending on the stationarity or the LMC and the G value of each vertex, you can um, essentially prune aggressively the tree as you can get the different variations of the, of the algorithm. So that's kind of uh, very quickly uh, what this 
right? So you can see here uh, these different versions, depending on how aggressive you're pruning the tree, you can show that uh, indeed you get the optimal solution. Uh, what can you do with these things? Oh, by the way, uh, one thing that I want to mention is that uh, the algorithm um, is going to um, needs to get to, to sample as smartly. And it turns out that uh, it still it doesn't scale extremely well in high dimensional spaces. The reason is that the probability that uh, that you're going to sample a good uh, point in the graph uh, it's going to be um, difficult as the as the as the dimensionality of the space. So, for example, the probability you're going to get a good sample decays exponentially with a with a with a dimensional real space. So that means that. As the space increases, it's very light, it's very highly unlikely that you're going to sample a point that uh, is going to be a good point for your solution. And uh, I'm not going to discuss smart smart sampling here, but we have some work that um, addresses this point, how you can sample in a smart way. Just want to tell you the fact that uh, one thing you could do is to de develop <clears throat> this uh, what I call deformable RRTs. This is uh, some work that we did um, a few years back. Where essentially you uh, you look at the data structure and uh, you realize that these points here they were sampled uh, randomly anyway. So why you should be stick to these points um, necessarily? You're maybe allowed to move these points around. You were lucky to sample the exact points. So you can use basically local gradient descent to move these points around, right? As you wish, since they're random anyways. And it turns out if you do that, you deform the RRT and you can. Uh, get very nice behavior uh, according to the dimensionality. As you can see here, <clears throat> we have three different versions. Uh, there is the RRT star, RRT sharp, still is better, but then still does not scale very well as the dimensionality increases. But you can see if you do this deformable RRT trick, uh, you can actually um, have a much better scaling with the dimensionality. What can you do with these types of problems? Uh, well, you can solve problems like this, uh, right? So seven, here is a couple of examples. You can solve puzzles. You can solve narrow corridors uh, in um, problems that you want to move something uh, inside, uh, like here in some corridor. You can do uh, robotic applications, seven-dimensional, 12-dimensional systems, and so on and so forth. These are simulations. Just to convince you that this is not just simulations, we have run this algorithm in the real system several years back. My student uh, who was uh, working on this problem, he uh, uh, was in an ONR project that uh, they wanted, ONR wanted to develop an autonomous helicopter, and uh, they wanted to operate in a large environment, 50 kilometers by 50 kilometers by 10,000 feet. That means if you grid that space, uh, you create a, a volume, a cube, that just uh, combined doing that, they will... Well, it will give you a huge graph that has uh, 800 million nodes and almost 11 billion edges. You just need 16 gigabytes to, to just store the graph. And uh, when you try to replan on this graph, uh, given the technology, it may take several minutes. And we want to replan very fast. <clears throat> By doing that, uh, instead of doing this uh, algorithm, we're able to, to solve this and, um, problem in a matter of seconds and we um, use it and actually test it more than 100 hours actually test it pretty nicely. So that's for the, um, that's for that. Uh, the question is what is, this, this again, this is a work that has been a few years now. What else can you do? Well, the lifelong planning A star that I just described that RRT star, as Sharp is based on finds the optimal solution and guarantees, because it inherits some of the properties of A star, that you don't expand vertices very, uh, a lot of vertices, right? So it turns out actually you don't expand vertices more than twice. In any case, you can minimize, it turns out you do uh, replanning, you minimize uh, the number of vertices. Uh, however, uh, just uh, minimizing vertices, um, like expanding the vertices, mean, meaning uh, figuring out what your neighbors are and how you connect to neighbor vertices, it's not the only one. It, we may have many edge evaluations. The edge evaluations are the step in the algorithm when you want to connect to your neighbor uh, vertices, and then you have to figure out how expensive it is to go to the neighbor edge. Now, if you have a fully actuated system, that's not a big deal. It means that you can probably connect to, your to one configuration to another configuration, perhaps with a straight line. But if you have a non-holonomic system, then that may not be true. Uh, plus, it may not be easy to do this connection. Very often, this connection requires that you're going to have uh, uh, multiple, you have to do collision checking, which is expensive. 
If you have a non-holonomic system, you may solve a two-point boundary value problem. And again, or you have to propagate the system using some closed-loop dynamics. So in any case, what I'm trying to say here is that there are problems that these edge evaluations are expensive. So um, how can you solve problems where these edge evaluations are expensive? Because if you have many edge evaluations that you slow down the algorithm. So there is idea has been around for a couple of years now to what is called the lazy search, which essentially delay edge evaluations um, until the last minute. Uh, and uh, the idea goes as follows. So for example, you want to go from, I hear of an example, you want to go from the beginning, which is the green, to, um, to the magenta, which is the final. And you basically solve the problem as if there are no obstacles and you assume that there is nothing to, to worry about. And when you find a path that seems to be the best path, then you look along this path, only along this path, and then you check for collisions. If there are no collisions, you're done. Uh, if there are collisions, then you eliminate this edge that we, that there was a collision, and then you go again. For example, here in number three, you can see I'm, I'm, co I'm checking for collision along this path that I computed without um, assuming that there was everything was free space, basically. And you see, okay, the first one is okay, it's blue, but the second one has a collision, so I remove it and then I replan again. And then you keep doing that, and then you find the optimal path. So, uh, so this is how the lazy search works. It is nice that it's minimizing uh, uh, edge evaluations, okay? So, but it turns out that uh, it can have many, uh, many uh, vertex expansions. So what we want to do actually to have some compromise between the two approaches. So we have approach that uh, the LPA star that uh, minimizes uh, vertex expansions, but you have also the lazy search that minimizes edge expansions or edge evaluation. So what we like to do if you do the planning to be able to have the best of both worlds. So, so this is our algorithm, which is called LGS, uh, recently developed um, it's, um, a few months ago. Uh, so basically, we uh, combine the vertex efficiency of uh, LPA star and the edge efficiency of generalized uh, lazy search that I just described. Okay, so the idea here is that you use um, lazy LPA star. Essentially, you're using ideas from LPA star in order to repair only the relevant part of the graph similarly to how the RRT sharp uh, works, okay? But at the same time, you run it on top of the uh, of the lazy evaluation. So here I give an example. You have already found a path. Maybe you have two, two options here, the, the blue ones, <clears throat> and then the other one, and then there is maybe an extra piece of information, a new piece of information that's continuing, for example, from the previous slides. So you have this green, two new green uh, vertices appearing here, then you have multiple connections, and instead of starting from scratch, you're using the already known information to do a very quick replanning. So I don't know if you can uh, have this uh, video here. You see that you uh, find a path, then something happens and changes the environment. Here is the door, and immediately you replan very quickly uh, by using prior information. So to convince you that this is indeed a good uh, uh, solution, here is two, two examples. One of them is a well-known uh, piano problem. Uh, and you see the difference between the three algorithms, LPA star, uh, GLS, which is a lazy search, and then uh, the uh, lifelong GLS, which is our algorithm. So you see that LPA star has very few vertex expansions as expected, but many edge evaluations. Okay, the GLS, the lazy uh, algorithm, the GLS generalized lazy search, you see that has very few edge evaluations, but has many vertex expansions. LGLS, uh, it's something between at the beginning, it looks like GLS is exactly like GLS, but when it's doing replanning, is using ideas from LPA star. And you can see here how things work, like in the LPA, LPA star again, has very few vertex expansions <clears throat> when you do replanning but a lot of edge evaluations. The opposite is for LGLS and, sorry, GLS. And our algorithm, all right, as you can see, has a very good compromise. So it has uh, much fewer, both vertex expansions and edge evaluations at the same time. And you can see the down here, the running time between the three approaches. And both for this example and uh, this uh, PR2 robot, uh, we perform much better. That's uh, what uh, the uh, this algorithm does. Uh, one thing, what else can you do? 
Uh, well, we have been applying these algorithms for real, real problems. And in real problems, you have more information than just the, the environment. You have actual information about uh, the types of environment you encounter. In robotics, for example, it may be of interest to ask questions. I want the robot to go from point A to point B. But I like to avoid, let's say, going over uh, particular types of, uh, of 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 surfaces. So I would like to to have a like have a, a maybe a robot operating in outdoors, and you would like to make sure that the robot, for example, does not go over um, grass or doesn't go over mud or gravel or what have you. Basically, what we want to do is to give some semantic information to environment and would like to incorporate this semantic information. So this is a plan problem, it's a planning problem that involves both geometric information, uh, but also semantic information. So uh, the semantic planning has become popular these days, and I'll show you uh, the solution to our problem. All right, so the idea is how you can use this semantic information to make, to make planning uh, better. All right, so again, this is you want an algorithm that combines both ge geometric and, and semantic information. Uh, we encode it in some graph. So here, uh, uh, just very quickly, essentially what you do is you look at the edges and you want to, um, to co color the edges in some sense in a certain way such that uh, you will get um, minimal inclusions of what's called low, low level uh, edges. For example, in this scenario, the red edges are not good the redder, the worse. So in this case, you see how the path tries to avoid the red edges as much as possible. So essentially, you have a priority queue. Um, so in generalization of A star, that we have a priority queue that allows you to put priority in the, in the, in the edges, and you're trying to minimize the bad color edges. So here's an example that you see, and you can see very quickly how you can use this information, for example, to, to, to guide the, 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 the environment or the search in a, in a particular environment. You can use this for a multi-level search. Here's another example uh, where the uh, uh, you can use it to color the edges that will give you some priorities about how, what are good edges to follow, and you can speed up replanning. Here is an example on the left of uh, the COA star, the color order A star on um, a particular uh, robotic vehicle. And on the left, you can see how some prior information um, you can implement that and you can do uh, planning and you can have examples of this example, which is actually 65% and 80% better than doing the whole thing, right? Much better, uh, fewer fewer vertex expansions and edge evaluations. So the last thing I want to, to mention is that something working these days is to expand this uh, planning algorithms for multi-agent path planning problems. This is actually a very hot topic these days <clears throat> because of the multitude of robots that are used, let's say, in warehouses. So in this case, you want to have a bunch of robots moving around and you know, going from one place to another, and you want to find a solution as a collision-free path from all, for all the robots that some, that some you minimize, for example, the make span, that is the time until the last agent reaches the goal or the flow time, which is the sum of all uh, paths. The current state of the art is the what's called the conflict-based approach. So essentially what you do is that uh, you decompose the problem in um, in an environment, and then you uh, do the problem uh, as if there was all, all, the, all the agents were in, uh, did not have collisions, and then you uh, basically search for collisions, okay? So uh, again, this is the so-called conflict-based search. It's, again, it's considered the state of the art in solving these types of problems. Essentially, it has two levels. You just solve uh, a space-time A star to find the shortest path for a single agent, as if uh, there were no edges around, then you look for conflicts, and then you construct another graph that allows, which is called the constraint tree, uh, that allows to avoid this um, this uh, these collisions. Um, so it turns out that there are cases like in, for example, in this scenario, if you want to have the agent one to go to G two or G one and uh, S two to go to G two, they will collide in T. So one of them has to wait, and you can see there is a collision of the third time step because both of them go to D. So in this case, you create a path, you fix the path of one, and then you put that as a constraint for the other one. So in this case, one has to wait a little bit before the other one moves, and you have two options. And uh, you you construct this tree, and then you follow this tree to find the optimal solution as a minimum span. But it turns out this is inefficient uh, because you may get many inefficient but short uh, than optimal paths, and you have to go through all of them. Here, where we're using is the uh, 
uh, the COA star. Essentially, what we do, we use instead of um, space time A star, we use a space, sorry, we, yeah, we use a space time COA star, the algorithm that with semantic information that I mentioned before. What you use now, we color the edges uh, if there are conflicts. This allows us to look ahead and to avoid future conflicts, and therefore uh, make sure that uh, we don't uh, go through the, con the, the constraint tree and expand the constraint tree more than is required. Basically, to just make, uh, since I'm running out of time, just to basically summarize, uh, the SOA star provides a more detailed information and you avoid paths to have collisions. For example, in this scenario, you have one collision here, <clears throat> then you replan again, but you have another collision uh, later on and you have to look at this and, and resolve this, where with the COA star, you essentially have, have color all the possibilities of one agent, that's all the agents, all the edges that conflict with the other agent that uh, you consider them as bad edges, for example, you color them with a bad color, and then this agent uh, takes that into consideration when replants, and it turns out uh, you can uh, replant uh, much faster. So just give you an example. So here it shows uh, how our algorithm scales concerned to the, uh, uh, the state of the art. There are better versions of the CBS. This is the enhanced CBS. This is the blue. It's still We still beat the, sp the state of the art right now uh, for most scenarios. And just to convince you how this thing works, this is an example that our algorithm, this is an example with 160 agents who can solve the planning problem in, a in less than a second. Well, the standard uh, conflict-based search cannot find a solution in one minute. So it's basically pretty pretty fast, and we can find the solution using this, um, uh, these types of uh, approaches. So since I'm almost run out of time, just want to tell you a few things um, about the takeaway points. As far as I'm concerned, their plan planning problems are the core of all uh, modern uh, decision-making or AI problems. We can have used control theoretic ideas, for example, dynamic programming to incorporate smart sampling to help uh, a lot the uh, sampling algorithms. We have shown extensions to multi agent problem, but still is a challenging problem. I don't want to claim that we completely solve pro this problem, but this is still a very hot topic. Uh, there are two things I did not discuss, uh, but you can look at uh, my website if you want to find the, the current uh, things uh, in this area, uh, how to handle uncertainty, uh, and also smart sampling strategies that also I did not discuss, but we have done significant amount of work how to sample smartly, because if you don't, sound, if you don't have a good smart sampling strategy, uh, these things are not going to work. All right, so I will wrap up here. If you want more information, uh, just well look at uh, my the lab site where I have most of the papers and also the YouTube channel. Uh, you can see some nice videos. So I don't want to keep you more because I know this at the end of the day, uh, but I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, is there any question? Hello, Professor. Very nice uh, presentation. Thank you. I. I would like to ask you, uh, how do you compare the performance of the algorithm, algorithms that you've shown compared with reinforcing learning algorithms? Reinforcement yes. learning is a, a little bit different in the sense that typically you assume that you don't have a model. That's when you, uh, that's when these algorithms are, are useful. So here I'm assuming I have a, I have a good model. Um, we haven't compared, uh, but typically it's going to be an unfair comparison because in reinforcement learning, you don't have a model, so you have to do more exploration to learn the model, right? So, so that's kind of my, uh, it would be an unfair comparison for reinforcement learning, let's put it this way. If, if you decide to do a fair, uh, like a head-to-head -to -head comparison, let's say, with respect to uh, speed or something, or something like that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. It was very interesting. And now we will move to the next presentation.